today we have a number of relatively complex questions that we'd like to try to address. And whether we'll succeed or not, of course, remains to be seen because there's a lot to talk about. And the questions may not, at first glance, appear to be related, although I think there are important connections among them. And obviously, we're going to have to try to piece together what we can learn from the Bible that pertains to each of these questions. So, without any further ado, let's begin with the first one. It, I think, in many ways, sets the tone for what we have discussed today. Question number one. We read in Psalms, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you founded strength because of your adversaries that you might still silence, stop the enemy and the avenger. And of course, transparently, there is an emphasis in this verse on the mouth of babes and sucklings, which inevitably raises the question, what is it saying here? The question continues, many people say we need to become like children, to grow in our trust and faith in God. What roles do children's honesty and purity have in our spiritual growth? And inevitably, who are the enemy and the avenger to overcome? The verse is certainly a striking one, and in many ways we could almost say a mystifying one. And there are indeed a number of different approaches that we find among Bible scholars in understanding what the verse is coming to teach us. To present to you a brief overview of some of these interpretations. So of course, on the one hand, we sense in the emphasis in the verse on the mouth of babes and sucklings, that there is a particular aspect of children that's being highlighted, the mouth, which leads some scholars to propose that the emphasis here is on the extraordinary, miraculous development of the power of speech. The power of speech being, after all, something that babes and sucklings develop. It almost seems out of nowhere. That is, of course, they hear adults speaking, but so do our pets, so do animals. And it's only the babes and the sucklings who learn to speak. And through that power of speech, we catch a glimpse of the guiding hand of God. Now, we should stress here, because especially in recent decades, much has been put forward, especially by anthropologists, regarding speech not being something that is truly unique in human beings, rather that there's a continuum with respect to the ability to express oneself. Animals have it in varying degrees, songbirds, the great apes, and of course, much stock has been made regarding those apes, in particular chimpanzees and gorillas, who were trained to communicate with human beings using sign language, using buttons on a kind of specially constructed computer on their behalf. And undoubtedly, we find communication throughout the animal kingdom. But, you know, I recall when the first studies concerning communication among the great apes were publicized, 
an observation that my father made, and that is a critical difference between all of these studies, all of these illustrations, all of these examples, and human beings lies in the ability to abstract. Human speech is not merely concerned with hand over the banana. Speech provides us with the extraordinary ability to formulate abstract ideas. And you know, perhaps in a way, the most miraculous aspect of it of all is on the one hand, we can only think in abstract terms by harnessing language. And yet, on the other hand, language itself needs to arise from someplace in order to grant us the ability to abstract. So this abstract capacity to express ourselves is perhaps especially for this reason a particularly apt means for appreciating God's presence. It is, in a very real way, a kind of creation from nothing, ex nihilo, that we're able to speak and we're able to abstract. And where it comes from remains an enigma. That, after all, is one aspect of you found its strength. The might of God's presence that we discern specifically out of the mouths of babes and sucklings. So that's one interpretation. And just as that interpretation stresses the mouths, it can also stress the babes and the sucklings. That is, the extent to which in the origins of life, the origins of life for the individual, we're able to discern the origin of the world itself. That specifically, through the coming into existence of the babes and the sucklings, we have an opportunity to catch a glimpse of the hand of God creating all. So here too, of course, inevitably, it's through our seeing the babes and the sucklings that you found its strength, that we're able to discern God's presence. Now these are two interpretations, of course, what they obviously have in common is speaking of the babes and the sucklings kind of as means, means to the end of our discerning God through them. In contrast, I'd like to present an alternative interpretation. This by one of the great Bible scholars of the 19th century. We've quoted from his writings in the past as well. I refer to Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch. He was a rabbi in Frankfurt, Germany for much of the mid 19th century. And while he wrote his commentaries, his commentary on the five books of Moses and his commentary on the book of Psalms in German, I hope you won't mind my sharing the words with you in English translation. He renders the first part of this verse, from the mouths of children and sucklings, you have fashioned for yourself an invincible might. And he comments, if the recognition of God were so difficult that it could be attained only by means of extensive scholarly study, if it were necessary, in the words of Scripture, and he alludes here to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 14, 
the emphasis that God's word is not to be sought in heaven or to be sought on the other end of the sea. It is rather with you in your heart and your mouth to do it. But if it were so far away, if it were necessary to penetrate into the mysteries of the supernatural world, the heavens, as well as into the secrets of the far-flung zones of the terrestrial spheres beyond the seas. If, if the name of God would not proclaim itself wherever the heavens arch over even one small spot of the earth. If, if this ABC of human recognition would not be intelligible to every pure childlike mentality, then indeed we would have to despair of the eventual establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. If it were the case that God were so remote, so unintelligible. But of course, that's not the case. And the emphasis then on the mouths of the children and the sucklings is they too can articulate this conviction because it becomes obvious even on the level of a child. Indeed, all those who find it convenient to recognize God's name, inconvenient to recognize God's name, and to accept the idea of a moral world order and of moral responsibility before one supreme judge of men and nations, would then find it an easy thing to expunge these thoughts and concepts from the minds of men. Too remote, too difficult, forget about it, erase it. However, the critical rejoinder, every baby that is born means the advent on earth of a pure soul. One more pure soul capable of God consciousness. And even if the very name of God were to disappear from all the books of an arrogant, erring human science, it could still never be expunged from the divine scriptures handed down from heaven anew to every unspoiled new generation. That new generation coming without the prejudices and preconceived notions, without the arrogance and hubris that are acquired traits, every new generation connects anew to its divine source. Even if much of the present were wretchedly lost to the hopes of mankind, the faith in the eventual coming of the kingdom of God, in the gathering of the entire community of man as one congregation about God, will still rest on a firm foundation because of the children and sucklings, the future generations. And Brother Hirsch continues, in this vein, in considering just who are the adversaries, the enemy, and the avenger. All of this you have given to us in order to build an indestructible foundation for your kingdom because of those who consider you an impediment for their ambitions 
and their views on life. These men would banish you from the thoughts of mortals. They would leave no room for God's guiding presence in actual everyday living, but would confine the worship of you to certain places, times, and occasions, to temples, churches, synagogues, festivals, and special ceremonies of life. It's all too convenient to relegate God and God consciousness to some innocent and irrelevant corner of human existence where it won't make a difference, where it won't impede our progress, where it won't affect the ability of man in all his arrogance to do whatever he pleases. Yeah, but out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, you conveyed that message to the world. And the concluding part of the verse, that you might still the enemy and the avenger, explains Rabbi Hirsch, in order to put an end at last to the doings of the enemy and the avenger, the proclamation of God's name, or the refusal to proclaim it, is not merely a matter of rendering to God his due, or of refusing, alternatively, to do so. This is much more a matter of the entire social weal or woe of mankind, which is conditioned primarily by the living, active influence of the divine idea on the attitude and relationship of men toward one another. Toward one another. Note. We speak of the enemy and the avenger. The name of God stands in the way of the adversaries, of those who wish to banish the concept of the divine from the mental horizon of men, or at least to limit it, because the presence of God will tolerate neither enemy nor avenger, neither misanthropy nor vengeance. If man and society were left to their own devices, without the concept of God as the creator and lawgiver. Each individual would recognize only his own right to existence because each person would then see only his own claim to happiness, thus of necessity, and therefore with some justification, he would see himself forced to take up the struggle for such existence. Self-preservation. Rabbi Hirsch doesn't use the words, but we could say survival of the fittest. That, then, would become the supreme goal of every individual, while all others would become merely fellow competitors who would interest him only insofar as they would make some contribution to his own existence or insofar as he hopes to use them, to exploit them, for his own ends, by stratagem or by force. He would sacrifice the well-being of anyone else if it should obstruct his own path to success. And if another shall actually have had an adverse effect upon his existence and welfare, then the ingenious or violent destruction of that stumbling block would become a great act of vengeance worthy of praise. Humanity in its most bankrupt state. The antidote. The antidote is, as Rabbi Hirsch expresses it, to be found in the childlike simplicity with all those who attempt to conceal God's hands. 
with all those who attempt to relegate God to irrelevance. The most decisive response is the little children who in their childlike simplicity are able to perhaps best realize the advice of the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40 to raise up your eyes and see who created these. Unfortunately, the scientist, the scholar, not mind you that we have anything against scientists and scholars, may all too often feel inclined to gaze upward and see merely a reflection of his own intellectual prowess. The child gazes upward and he sees God. And in that childlike simplicity, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you found its strength. Again, that invincible might that gives the lie to those who would banish God consciousness from the human mind and the human heart. So, of course, this interpretation focuses on the little children, the babes and the sucklings, not merely as means to engendering a certain perspective, a certain insight in us, but rather as a kind of archetype, template, guiding us to be able to appreciate God's hand in the world and in our lives. And of course, then, to the extent that the little children, the babes and sucklings, serve as the spearhead of this realization, of this consciousness, perhaps we can append to this third approach, if you're keeping count, of how to understand the thrust of this verse, a fourth, namely, of course, well, specifically, the psalmist speaks of the mouths of babes and sucklings versus the enemy and the avenger, the adversaries outside. Maybe an additional possibility that flows almost inevitably from Rabbi Hirsch's interpretation is the child within us. Because inevitably there is a tug of war, a battle taking place inside each and every one of us. On the one hand, there is the voice of the child staring in unfettered awe and reverence at the grandeur of the world and discerning almost instinctively God's presence as manifest to those childlike eyes. And on the other hand, we also have within ourselves the enemy and the avenger. The overinflated ego. The Americans say, look out for number one. And when they say it, they're not referring to God as number one, but rather for each and every individual, my own self. The tendency that's always lurking someplace in the recesses of our soul to regard ourselves as it is the be-all and end-all of all existence. And that tug of war inevitably continues on some plane, unabated, throughout life. On the one hand, again, childlike reverence and awe 
discerning as a natural consequence, God's presence, God's inescapable imminence in every aspect of our lives. And that other voice, that alternative, to blind ourselves to God, to blind ourselves to meaning, to blind ourselves to anything that gets in the way of our own ambitions. Now, this last fourth interpretation perhaps best highlights a problem that we can't help but confront, especially if we take the mouths of babes and sucklings as the means, not merely the template that exhibits God's presence to us, but the means through which we sense God. If it requires having the purity of childhood to sense God, then on the one hand, we can very well appreciate the continuation of the question. Many people say we need to become like children to grow in our trust and faith in God. And, of course, that would necessarily lead to an obvious answer to the question. What roles do children's honesty and purity have in our spiritual growth? We'd say, what roles? Very important roles. We have to go back to that childlike simplicity, that honesty and purity, in order to be able to connect with God. That is, we find, again, not only in the world, but in ourselves, that inner conflict, that struggle between the child within us and the jaded, egotistical cynic, the one who has learned all of the ingenuity and contrivances of life's experiences and all the tricks of the trade in stifling that child's voice. That's one way, of course, of looking at life. And on the one hand, it's true. Don't we feel that sometimes? But there's another hand here. That is, on the other hand, if this were really the way we conceived the spiritual growth, I have to admit, I would find it awfully depressing. Depressing because with everything we're striving to achieve in life, this would imply that all we really need to do is go back to being children. But we're not looking to remain in life in some childish, stunted state. Is there really no value in growing up? Is our spiritual growth contingent, paradoxically, on an intellectual regress to grow backwards into childhood? There's something that's profoundly dissatisfying in such an attitude. I think it's important for us to consider an additional dimension, maybe in a way, an almost converse dimension that I submit is no less important than what we've said thus far. Because, you know, in conceiving of how we grow and how we develop in our lives, nowadays, there is admittedly a tendency, I'd say a very unfortunate tendency, to practically worship youth as if the prospect of growing older is something to be discouraged at all costs. And when we consider the message of Ecclesiastes, I submit that we get a message that runs almost diametrically opposite that prejudice that we have. And considering, in particular, the thrust of Ecclesiastes, 
chapter 7, verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. The day of death than the way of day of one's birth? We celebrate when a baby is born. Why should we regard the day of death as preferable to the day of birth? Uh, but if we were indeed to worship youth, if indeed we regarded life as an inexorable process of decline and decay, then it would be true that the day of birth is, of course, to be preferred. But if, on the other hand, we regard our mission in life as actualizing spiritual potential, well, when a baby is born, that potential isn't actualized at all. It's all latent. Something that could be, that would be, that should be, that we hope will be. But at the day of birth, there's nothing there. A baby comes into the world merely as a physical being, endowed with spiritual potential that is yet unactualized. And after life well lived, after life dedicated to acts of kindness, to growing spiritually, to coming closer to God, that spiritual potential isn't merely potential anymore. It's been actualized. The day of death, in that sense, is incomparably more precious. It is better than the day of birth. I can't help but note here that there is a tendency in many Western cultures to commemorate the birthdays of great men. So, for example, speaking of the United States, which is a country with which I suppose I'm more familiar than others, we celebrate Washington's birthday, Lincoln's birthday, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Interesting that in the Torah traditions of the Jews, birthdays are not the dates of commemoration of the people who have lived. Rather, the days we commemorate for the great people of our past are not the birthdays, but the death days. Using the commonly invoked Yiddish expression, yard site, the year's time commemorating the day of death. Why commemorating the day of death? Because of Ecclesiastes. Because the day of death is better than the day of birth. It's commemorating life well lived. But getting back to our verse here in Psalms, again, I want to remind you, we have a problem. Because if all we have to say about God's founding strength is focusing on the young child, then why exactly is life for all together? Is it just a matter of a challenge to grow backward, to regress to childhood? And to answer this question, Really, to expand on my fourth interpretation regarding the inner conflict between the child within us and the enemy and avenger within us, I'd like to share with you another verse from Ecclesiastes. From Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 13. Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who no longer knows how to take care of himself. Now, of course, the statement taken literally is a truism, but 
in our tradition, the meaning of this verse is much deeper than a simple-minded comparison between a wise child and a foolish king, rather. When we each come into the world, each of us, as physical beings, are, of course, endowed with basic drives, instincts, instincts of self-preservation that lead us to seek what we need. Inevitably, these are essentially egotistical desires. They are physical desires, cravings, even the newborn maybe, experiences hunger, wails in order to get what that baby needs in order to survive. As we grow older, those drives don't disappear. If anything, they become more varied and more complex. But we always, as physical beings in a physical world, which we are, lifelong, are motivated by these physical drives within us to get what we want to get what we convince ourselves, sometimes with a measure of exaggeration, we need. These drives, again, are with us from birth. And inevitably, these drives are something of another side of the coin with respect to that Childlike simplicity, the honesty and purity of which we spoke a few minutes ago. Because that self same lack of pretensions. With a child, you are what you are. No veneer, no overlay. The real article. So these drives also are the real article. I want it. I'm going to get it. And from birth, the child is animated by these deeply rooted drives. Unfortunately, there are people who are only animated by these drives their whole lives. Is that all there is? Better not be. There is something else. In the verse in Ecclesiastes, again, there was a comparison between a wise and poor child and an old and foolish king. Well, these drives rule over us. So these drives are king. And since they're with us from birth, they're pretty old. They're as old as we are. But they're also foolish. Because there isn't any underlying depth here. Again, it's the immediacy of you are what you are. I need this. Period. But as we grow up, we have the wherewithal to cultivate something more. That wise and poor child, we cultivate wisdom. We cultivate an element of depth in saying things, not merely in terms of the immediate, but appreciating nuance. Being able to exercise self-restraint because we understand that the immediate grabbing of our drives, really in the long run, is not what's best for us. Cultivating that intellect, that wisdom, is something that happens only with age. Now, ironically, since it only comes with age, it's much younger than those drives that are with us from birth. So that's not 
the old king that's the child the wise child now of course ironically the king remains king those drives after all are drives of self-preservation and they never relinquish their hold upon us until we die and yet still even though that child is poor not the king that wisdom is the greatest asset and so again returning to this cryptic verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 13 better is a poor and a wise child than an old and a foolish king of course I'm emphasizing precisely this verse because you notice it's talking about child wisdom child insight and of course we realize that wisdom is something that's only acquired with old age but maybe in a way that wisdom provides us with the means to come to God to attain a clarity that as biological children and even as intellectual children we could never attain that is as a bottom line in appreciating what the mouth of the babes and sucklings give to us on the one hand again we speak of the honesty and purity that have their roles in spiritual growth that very immediacy and simplicity that mark the child on the other hand it's not simply a matter of regressing to childishness because on some plane that honesty and purity are endowments that need to go hand in hand with the wisdom that is acquired specifically by our growing our experiencing life our learning the tools of deep demanding analysis to not merely look at the world of childish simplicity and it's that child again the wise and poor child but not merely a child a wise child that likewise plays a critical role in our defeat of the enemy and the avenger because on this plane it is precisely through the wisdom that we're really able to foster that honesty and purity in vanquishing the egotistic arrogance of the enemy and the avenger and I'd like to conclude then on this thought that when we speak of the mouth of babes and sucklings on the one hand it certainly is important for us to gaze with an element of respect and admiration at the purity of the young child no denying that but on the other hand let's not think that the goal in life is to return to the womb or the cradle to merely become children to regress on the contrary to attain that honesty and purity through in the context of the wisdom the penetrating insight the understanding the analytical ability that is really the supreme goal to be able to maintain within ourselves the childish simplicity and this child's wisdom in the words of Ecclesiastes the penetrating insight together through both of these you God 
found its strength in us and enabled us to vanquish the enemy and the Avenger within. With this insight into how we fight our spiritual battles, I think we're ready to continue.